Well, my name is Caleb. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. It's great to be with you. We are continuing on in our series called The Promise. Uh, It's looking at the patriarch, uh, the life of Abraham. Last week we looked at how God called Abram before he was even called Abram, how he, how he was called by God. And this week we're going to look at a little bit of a, a dilemma that he was in uh, with him and then with, with his nephew Lot and kind of the motivation behind the decisions they made. And then next week we'll, we will continue with Abram, with Pastor Joe. He'll be back in the pulpit next week and he's out of town this weekend at a family wedding. Uh, but if you do have your Bibles, would you please turn to Genesis chapter 13? And we will look at a passage, uh, the first 17 verses of Genesis chapter 13. And as you're turning there, let me just remind you of a couple things from last week. The fact that God called Abram. There was nothing Abram did to make himself worthy to be called upon by God. God chose him and called on him. And he went in obedience and it was a very tough thing in that culture because he was leaving the protection of his family and of the patriarch of of his own father uh, who had passed away. And and in that, it's hard for us to get a sense of the the magnitude of Abram leaving um, for us in the 21st century living in America because we value independence and we value our freedom. mostly even over family and and in that culture family was a very high priority if not the highest priority so it was something where Abram was called out and and it was very significant he was going against the grain of culture in order to obey God and then the other part of his call is it wasn't about him it kind of seems like it may have been about him but it was about blessing other people through him. God said that he would bless those who bless Abram and curse those who curse Abram. So he wanted to use Abram and the Jewish people as a conduit of blessing because a long, long time after God called Abram, uh, the Messiah came and, and, and the Messiah came through that Jewish lineage. So the Messiah was a blessing to the world and Abram was a blessing to the world because of that. So I just wanted to frame that as now Abram has moved from uh, his father's household and his, his country, his people, and he's moving and, and he's been called out and he's moving to Canaan, the land that God said he would give to Abram. So this is Genesis chapter 13, the first 17 verses. The word of God says this, so Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first, and there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot who went with Abram also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or, if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever." I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, 
Walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. That's God's word for us. Now from this passage, what I want to do is look at Lot's perspective, the ambition, the ambition that Lot had. I want to look at Abram's perspective, the faith that Abram had. And then I want to look at God's perspective and his word. So Lot's ambition, Abram's faith, and then God's word. As I was bringing us back into the context of this passage before I read it, it's important to note as well that this was an opportunity here for Abram to demonstrate his faith. But before we get to Abram's faith, it's important to look at the ambition that his nephew Lot had surrounding this decision. You see, because when Abram took Lot and Sarai, Abram's wife, when they moved from his father's land and went into Canaan, they settled there for a while and then they moved down to Egypt because of a, of a famine in Canaan. And they had to move because livestock back in that day was currency. If you had that, you were secure, you had a future, you had wealth. And so they moved down to take care of their livestock and to take care of their family members. And then they moved back up into the promised land, into the land of Canaan. So they headed south to go to Egypt. Now they're returning north to go back up into Canaan. And Abram recognizes a problem that they have. The land is, is not able to meet the demands of all the grazing that's been required by their livestock. And so Abram says, hey, Look at the land before us. You know, they're facing north, looking into the promised land. To the east of them, to the right of them, was the Jordan Valley, rich in vegetation. And then to the left of them was more mountainous crags, kind of this rocky terrain. And it was rocky because as you went up in elevation from the Jordan Valley, less and less vegetation grew at that elevation. And I have a picture that I wanted to show you just so you kind of know what we're dealing with. So you see kind of this rich green Jordan Valley and then as you go up toward the top of the picture, the elevation, things become more and more sparse. And so that helps us get a visual of kind of what these men were looking at. And the reason it's significant is because if you had your livestock taken care of, you were good. And it's, it, again, it's kind of hard for us to understand that living in America in the 21st century. I remember growing up uh, in Africa, my parents were missionaries, and it was when I was 10 or 11, and we kind of first moved to the country, and I did not realize the significance of livestock and how it was currency for some people groups, and it still is currency for some people groups today. So part of our orientation as missionaries, my parents and our family, we had to move around and live with different tribes to get a sense of who they were in order for us to figure out how to bring them the gospel. And so one tribe we lived with was called the Wakamba tribe. And we were living with this family. And this family, uh, they were so excited to have, have us that they, they wanted to bring us around to their friends and family around the village and introduce us. And, and so I had two older brothers and one younger sister at the time. So the four of us kids and my mom and dad, we went out and we walked around the village and we were meeting these families. And one of... Um, one of these families we met, they had three daughters, and the, the two older daughters were the same ages as my two older brothers, and then the youngest daughter was the same age as me, about 10 or 11. And I remember after we, we met them and we, we introduced ourselves, our dads, my dad and the dad of this family were talking, and, and he said, hey, how, how, much can I, uh, how much is it to buy your youngest son, the, you know, the little skinny one with blonde hair? And I remember going, What? And he goes, my daughter is the same age as him and, you know, I'd like to buy him as a prearranged marriage so then when they get to be about 15 or 16, they can get married. And at that point, I was sweating, but now I was really sweating. <laughs> and I looked at my dad thinking, surely, you know, it's a, no, you know, he's not for sale. But my dad, uh, he, had, he had a beard and a mustache at the time, so he kind of began to tug on his beard as he was thinking. And he kind of looked up and and he was pulling on his beard, and this is when I was sweating bullets now, because it looked like he was, you know, thinking, how many cows should I ask for? And, and, and the, the, the other dad kind of saw that my dad was hesitating, and he kind of leaned in and said, I have many, many heads of cattle I can give to you for your son. And at that point, I'm like, oh 
my gosh, you know, I'm in the background going, Dad, no, no, don't do this. Not a good idea. And uh, so my dad kind of got a twinkle in his eye and, and he released me from my pressure. He said, hey, he's not for sale. You know, we're, um, sorry about that. And, and we, you know, we kind of parted ways. Uh, but, but I remember from that point on that I was going to do my own negotiating. I was going to let my dad be my agent for me ever again because he put me through the ringer with that one. But it gave me a real sense of these people, um, they, they count on the vegetation so their animals can be cared for because their animals are incredibly significant to them. And so that's why this decision is so important. And that's why Lot, if you look at the passage, immediately Lot goes, oh, I will take, I will take to the right. I will go to the east because that is guaranteed right now. I need that here and now. My livestock need to eat. I need to eat. We need to be secure right now in the present. And Lot had zero perspective on the future. And he was all about self-preservation. Lot's operating system to make decisions was absolute self-preservation. I need to survive. I need to do this. This has to happen right now for me. And so he didn't even consider Abram or Abram's family. He just said, green, lush valley, my livestock, I'm there. I'm taking it. And it's interesting that in the verse 13, it says, now the men of Sodom, where, where Lot was going, were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Lot did not care. He was going into the midst of that wickedness because all he saw were dollar signs. That's what he cared about, self-preservation. He was operating out of a selfish ambition for himself alone. It was all about Lot. His operating system was self-preservation. And that is contrasted starkly with Abram's faith, isn't it? Abram, in this passage, He has been wrestling a little bit with God, hasn't he, leading up to this point. He's been called by God. He goes. He doesn't know where. He's been told that God is going to make of him many, many nations. And his wife is barren. So Abram's faith journey has just begun. And he trusts God for this inheritance. And then God brings him to the land of Canaan. And he trusts God because God says, this is the land where your offspring from your barren wife are going to be. This is their land. So Abram has been given offspring, a promise of offspring, and then a promise of land. But what does he do the moment there's famine in the land? Does he trust God? No. He goes into self-preservation mode and he moves all the way down to Egypt. God didn't tell him to go to Egypt. God said, this is where you and your people will dwell. This is the land I'm giving you. And Abram, at the first sign of, of Trouble went self-preservation mode. I got to save my own skin. I'm going into Egypt. He ends up lying about his relationship with Sarai, his wife. Sarai, his wife, gets taken into the harem of Pharaoh. God has to come in and deal with different things in that instance. And then they go back up to Egypt. And they go back from Egypt, sorry, they go back up to the land of Canaan. And now Abram is given another opportunity where he can either go self-preservation mode or I am absolutely going to trust in the Lord for my future. And remember what he was up against. Vegetation, land, survival for his animals meant survival for his family, meant wealth for him. Everything was riding on this decision in the sense of you will make it or you won't for your future. And Lot had already seized the opportunity and taken the lush land. So now Abram goes up to the rocky, mountainous terrain, fully trusting in God. And do you see what's happening in Abraham at this point? He's going, wow, God is so worthy of my trust. God is so worthy of my trust. Abram's operating system is not self-preservation like his nephew Lot. Abram's operating system is the word of God. It's the promises of God. At this point, like I said, God has promised him land. God has promised him offspring. And at this point, Abram goes, I am all in trusting God. I learned my lesson from Egypt. I am not operating out of self-preservation anymore. I am trusting in God. This was counterculture too, this decision, because Abram as the older would have had first rights to either the rocky mountain terrain or the lush Jordan Valley. But he gives it to Lot, which is a demonstration of faith, isn't it? A demonstration of faith in whom? 
not himself, but God. He completely trusts God in this situation. And he says, Lot, if you go to the east, I will go to the west. Lot, if you go west, I will go east. You choose. The right move from a cultural standpoint would have been for Lot to say, oh no, Uncle Abram, I, I cannot disrespect you. You choose. You choose, Uncle. And wherever you go, I will go in the opposite direction. But Uncle, you choose. No way. When, when you're operating out of self-preservation, that kind of stuff doesn't come into your mind. It's all about you. And Lot demonstrates that with a great example. I'm taking the Jordan Valley. I'm gone. And Abram says, I'm trusting in God. I'm taking the rocky terrain. Because why? Because his operating system was the word of God. It was God's promises. Abram was beginning to grow in his relationship with God. He was beginning to mature. He was beginning to realize that God is worthy of his trust and that by acting in obedience to God's word, it actually glorifies God, doesn't it? When we trust in God for our futures, it glorifies him. And what were we created to do as his creation? magnify him, glorify him, put him on display. Abraham, his, his vision was not right here like Lot's. His, his vision was of the future. Abram said, I am, I am in God. Whatever you have for my future, I am completely trusting in you. If you go over to the book of Hebrews, it highlights Abram's faith in chapter 11. This chapter is often referenced or referred to as, as the Hall of Faith. It's, it's this chapter that highlights these faithful men and women who have gone before us. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, this is what the writer of Hebrews, who is being inspired by the Holy Spirit, this is what he writes about Abram. Hebrews eleven eight. By faith Abraham obeyed, when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac, his son, and Jacob, his grandson, heirs with him of the same promise. And then this is the verse I wanted to highlight. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He was not concerned with his present. He was concerned with his future, and he gave it to the Lord. And subsequently, when you give your future to the Lord, your present is also taken care of, isn't it? Common sense would have been saying, Abram, what are you doing you have the rights as the older man in the family to go take the land that you want and you're offering it to Lot and then he selfishly with great ambition chooses it and now you're left high and dry. Your future is in great jeopardy, Abram. The voice in his head, the common sense would have been saying, what are you doing? It would have been so easy for you just to seize this right here and now and be satisfied. But Abram's perspective was on the future, on a city whose foundations were built by God. So it's a stark contrast. Lot's operating system is this selfish ambition, self-preservation. And when you operate out of this, everything becomes relative and lines get blurry, don't they? And then Abram, operating out of his faith in God, he was relying upon the promises of God, the word of God. He had learned his lesson from Egypt. There was no anxiety in him. There was not the same angst that he had when the famine hit in Canaan that forced him down to Egypt. No, he was not going to disobey God this time. He was going to stay stuck in to God's promises. And then that brings us to the third perspective, God's word. God's word. It's interesting that if you go to verse 14 in chapter 13, as soon as Lot leaves, as soon as Lot leaves, the Lord said to him in verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes 
and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. He would have been looking at the land, the Jordan Valley, where Lot was moving. God was saying, look north, look south, look east, look west, look 360 degrees around you. Then he says this, for all the land, verse 15, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. God comes to him and he reminds him, hey, I know what your situation currently looks like. It looks like you're going to be high and dry, but you're not. Look around at the land. This is going to be your offspring's land. Then he says, verse 16, this is God speaking to Abram, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. That's a lot of offspring. (laughs) Grains of sand, dust of the earth. Abram, I'm going to make so many people from you and they're going to dwell here. I'm going to make a nation from you. I know your wife is barren and I know you're looking right now between the crosshairs where you're headed and it looks like poor land. But I'm telling you, I got you, Abram. I have your future. And by the way, because I have your future, I have your present as well. And Abram trusted in God. The perspective of God is this. Will you trust me? He's asking you, will you trust me? I know at times in our lives, look, I get it. You come to a situation where you could take the rocky terrain or you could take the, the, the present, the, the lush green valley. And I know that that rocky terrain looks very, very bad and it looks very doubtful. And you know, you know God is asking you to take the rocky terrain. Perhaps it's in your marriage. Perhaps you're going, man, if I stuck in my marriage, that is looking rocky. I'd rather take this adulterous affair, either physical affair, emotional affair, and be satisfied right here and now. But God, you're asking me to stay into my marriage? That's rocky. That looks doubtful. And God is saying, I have your future. You know what I have in store for you. I have it. I have your present as well. Perhaps it's your sexual identity. You're going, God, I I have same-sex attractions. And and God is saying, don't indulge them. Take the rocky terrain. Choose holy living. Don't take the short, lush green valleys, the here and the now. Trust me. Trust me. Maybe it's in your business interactions. God is asking you to deal honestly with your business affairs and you want to shade the truth with lies because it's the lush green valley. And God is saying, take the rocky terrain. Honor me. Trust me, I have your future, I have your present. Perhaps it's in how you parent and you'd rather be friends with your kids than discipline them. You'd rather give them free roam over things because you know the discipline is just too rocky to deal with. And you take the short term and God is saying, I want you to raise kids this way. Take the holy life. Perhaps it's witnessing to a neighbor or a colleague, a coworker, a friend. God is saying, hey, it... I want you to communicate to this person about my son. And you're going, God, that's a rocky terrain. I'd rather just avoid it. I'd rather talk about the weather. I'd rather talk about sports. I'd rather talk about politics. I'd rather talk about anything other than Jesus. And God is saying, trust me. I have your future. I have your present. Perhaps you're in a dating relationship or an engaged relationship and you're going, God, abstaining from from premarital sex is too difficult. It looks too rocky. That terrain is too rocky. I'd rather choose the short-term pleasures now. Let me tell you, the holy life is always going to be rocky looking when compared to the fertile plains of sin. And God is asking you to choose holiness and he's telling you why. You know why he's telling you that? Because it honors him. It reflects him. It reminds me of when I was a child And I was old enough when my parents were telling me, hey, Caleb, don't do this or don't do that. And I was going, why? Why can't I do that? And you know, as a parent, (laughs) I'm going to say the same thing as Silas when he's old enough to understand what I'm saying to him. Because I said so. Because I said so. But now being on this side of parenting, I know what because I said so means. It means, hey, Caleb, what you're doing is going to lead to hurt for you. It's going to lead to some sort of destruction in your life. 
And I'm asking you as a parent who has lived longer, who knows more, who loves you so incredibly much, I'm asking you to, to not do that because I said so, which means because I know more, so therefore trust me. I love you. I want what's best for you. Trust me because I said so. The book of, Levitic, of Leviticus is a book where I'm reading through that right now for my devotions, and it's a book where there are just rules and rules and rules and rules, and God is saying, do this, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do this. And I found myself in my journal, journaling down and writing down, God, why? Why this? Why that? And over the last few months, the resounding response I've gotten from the Lord is, because I said so. Israel, do this because I said so, which really means Trust me, because I'm an infinite God who loves you with an infinite love. And I'm asking you to trust me. Trust me with your future. Trust me with your present. Whatever you're going through, the situations in life, they are changing. But I am unchanging. You can always take me at my word, at my promises. And some of you might be saying, Caleb, that's great for Abram. He, he was a guy who heard from God, who got promises of offspring and land, and it was easy for Abram to trust God. I feel like I've made it quite clear from tonight that it was not easy for Abram to trust God. But you're still going, well, I, well, God, well, God spoke to him audibly. He heard him. It was easy for him to trust God. What is God saying to me? What promises has he given me? And I just wanted to share a list of promises and then ask you if you think based off these promises that your God is worthy of your trust. Is your God worthy of your trust? These are promises from scripture that God gives us for who we are and for what he's going to do and for what he will do. You are a child of God. As a disciple, you are a friend of Jesus Christ. You've been justified. You're united with the Lord and you are one with him in spirit. You've been bought with a price and you belong to God. You are a member of Christ's body. You've been chosen by God and adopted as his child. You've been redeemed and forgiven of all your sins. You are complete in Christ. You have direct access to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. You are free from condemnation. You are assured that God works for your good in all circumstances. You are free from any condemnation brought against you and you cannot be separated from the love of God. You've been established, anointed, and sealed by God. You are hidden with Christ in God. You are confident that God will complete the good work he started in you. You are a citizen of heaven. You've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You are born of God, and the evil one cannot touch you. Remember, this is if you are in Jesus Christ. You are a branch of Jesus Christ, the true vine and a channel of his life. You've been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. You are God's temple. You are a minister of reconciliation for God. You are seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. You are God's workmanship. You may approach God with freedom and confidence, and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So I ask you again, does your life demonstrate by the decisions you've made that your God is worthy of your trust? Let's pray. Father, we come before you asking that you would do a mighty work in us. Even as difficult as it is to trust you, we ask that you would give us the strength to trust you like Abram did. When all situations are changing, when the future looks bleak, when it looks way better to indulge in sin than the rocky road of holy living, help us to choose you, to trust in you. In your name I pray, amen. proclamation of the word the the song is called forever and I couldn't help but think about as Caleb was teaching that our mind should be set on forever not on now and so this is a great song that we can just sing to respond to that work that God can start in